I noticed I, I think I went way over time there. I hope you forgive me for that. Sometimes I, we get moving, we move, right? So you got to make sure you don't have anything cooking at home. It might burn. You know, you never know. But uh, glad you're here tonight, you know? And um, when I bring these classes, uh, I, I see myself a lot of times, and a lot of these things, how we raised our children. And that's why I like talking about it, not in a negative sense, but sometimes I have to say this way, uh, we do the best that we knew how at that point in time in life, right? So when I take a look at my parents, I have wonderful parents. Uh, they weren't perfect parents, but neither am I. What I say is they did uh, the best to their ability and knowledge, and I choose to believe that. They did something for the Lord, right? And uh, I say for us, if we, we've seen more light and how to do things and so forth, then we want to do it a little differently. But, but I don't want to look back and condemn mom and dad for what they did. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, if we do that, we, we get into a rut, and it's not, it doesn't bring fruit in our own lives. So here in this class, I want to talk about a curse or blessing. I actually drew it, most of it there, but I'm going to just going to present it here. And uh, same thing, except sometimes if I don't use the PowerPoint, I'll do a little bit more drawing on the whiteboard, right? So uh, curse or blessing is my, my thoughts on what, what choices we make. So I'm going to have here an example of a history of choices that two men made. They lived about the same time. And one made one choice, the other made another choice, and what happened during their lifetime. So e each one here tonight, we, make it, we have made choices today that will impact our own lives and our family life. Our, family, our spiritual life, how we grow, how we are sanctified. We've all made choices today. A lot of choices, I'm sure we did. But, but here, this way, is it a curse or a blessing? Do we want to choose to remain and do the things the way we always have done or look to a new way that actually will bring blessings into our own life? So the first verse here, it's Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I have it here on the PowerPoint. So it says this way, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. That's God's desire, that we and our descendants. I've always noticed when, when we read about the Jews, the Jews were always very concerned about our children and the grandchildren and to the fourth generation. They were very uh, ed, into it that th those families would find God. They would serve God. And, and sometimes I wonder where we're at today. Like, How often do we talk about God, about Christ and what he's done you know, and I have the verses here yet later. It talks about in Deuteronomy, God says, you talk about me. You talk about me when you stand up, when you walk along the road, when you go to sleep. You talk about me. But where are we at today? You know, my impression is a child's character is formed by, by the time he's about seven years old. Most of it's formed. So what are we planted in the first seven years? What's, what's there? Because the Catholic Church, the Muslims, the Jews say, if we have a child the first seven years, it's ours. It's going to remain ours. How about we? The first seven years implants something in their little heart about who God is. So here I had that, what I wrote, wrote down there. It's just more on a picture. Uh, I call this commandment-oriented, okay? What God has said, I choose to believe and do it. So what I'm saying here is this way. If God said 2,000 years ago or more, whatever time frame, that he said it's sin, it's still sin today. God hasn't changed his mind. So the commandment is, like for me as a husband, to love my wife, for my, for my wife to submit to my, my leadership. So some of these things God has commanded in the Old Testament and New Testament, it's not hard to grasp, but sometimes just hard to say, yes, Lord, this is what I want to do, and I put, put my, my mind to it. But commandment-oriented, I would find more in Matthew 7. If you, uh, I don't have the verses written on the PowerPoint, so I'm just going to read them here. So Matthew 7, verse 24. And there it says this way. Um, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. That's a picture. So I, I, I took a picture from the internet and cabin and uh, some stone looks, looks uh, solid, doesn't it? And, and this, I would say this way, this is by grace through faith. We believe it by faith. See, Hebrews 11 one says by faith, right? Hebrews 11:6. 6, without faith, we're going to please God. So we have to choose to believe that God says, this is the way I am to live, a holy life. He says, be more like Christ, more Christ-like, daily walking. 
And, and then we have that grace through faith, and then the circumstances come. Take a look at that there. Circumstances are things in your life that will come up that sometimes we have no uh, control over, but these circumstances will come up. And I believe God chooses to allow these things to make us stronger. But t- take a look at this. If I'm oriented this way, commandment, what God has said, is there. That means I will love that person, doesn't matter what they do to me. Let me take an example this way. As a Christian, he's working in a, in a, maybe in a place where, he, where his boss is very short-tempered, swears a lot. But if this boss comes to him and when he's not converted, he's an unbeliever, and that boss, he swears at him, his natural instinct will pop up, his flesh says, this I'm not going to allow. He will swear back at his boss. He'll quit his job. He doesn't care about these things. He'll walk it right out the door. That's when circumstances hit. But as a Christian, God says, thou shalt not. You will not do that. You will love your neighbor. You will show kindness to him. You'll be kind to these people. So what happens when this Christian, the boss hasn't changed, but this young man, as a Christian, when the boss starts swearing at him, he will not swear back. He would like to. His natural desire is to do the same thing. But the Spirit says, don't do it. Don't do it. And if something happens, he loses his control, and he says something, his heart will hurt. He will have a pain. Remember that yesterday we had the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, how he, the tax collector smites his breath. This young man, he would smite his breath and say, Lord, I am so sorry I did that. That's not who I want to be. Please forgive me. He'll walk after his boss, catch him in his office, and say, Sir, I am truly sorry what I said there. I should not do that. I want to be a good employee. Please forgive me for what I said there. I will try to obey you to the best of my ability. Please forgive me what I did. That's what happens here. He does a godly, righteous response. Do you understand that? He does not allow his flesh to control his feelings. Take a look at what happens here. And that gives us hope that things can change. We're learning. We're dealing with these things. We're not just allowing our flesh to run wild again. We say, Lord, I'm truly sorry. And that gives me hope that I can love that person. I'll pray for him. I I sometimes tell people this way, you cannot remain mad at a person that you're praying for. Pray for that person. Pray for your boss, that he can have a change of heart, that he doesn't swear as much, but it gives you no right to swear if he does. Make that clear. God commands we are not supposed to do that. And if we have that hope, take a look, for God's glory to honor and please him. That's our desire, to have God number one in our life. But take, take a look on flat feeling oriented. Notice where I placed the house? <laughs> By the seashore, on sand. That's about where it is, feelings. Who, have you ever made a feeling-based decision, anybody? You know yeah. who, who knows how feelings can really lead us astray? You ever notice that? Let me give an example. Let's say you come to church on Sunday. You're young people. I'm going to pick on the young people now. So you're sitting there, and you see your best friend walking in the door, and, and he avoids you. He's just walking to the other side and looking sour like he swallowed a frog or something like that, and he doesn't look at you, and you're, you're starting to get ticked here. Well, so what do I do to him? You know, we start thinking. And remember, we can make the little uh, Anton elephant, right? He's thinking, what do I do? That guy? He's mad, and, I, you know, and he starts thinking, wow, he's going to get it. And by the time the church service is done, you haven't heard a word, but you're really mad at that friend. You meet him in the back, and you, now you look sour. And you meet him up and says, what's wrong with you? Oh, he says, I have a toothache. That's it? A toothache? Yeah. Wow, what did we just imagine? Our feelings were really, we were ready to tear out his mustache or beard. or whatever. We were ready to go at him. And we find out there's nothing based on that. It's not even truth. It's just feeling. T- take a look what happens here in Matthew 7, 26. I'm going to read 25 also. He, taught, he says this way, verse 25, he says, Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, that means I would say the devil's temptings, right? It won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. The first one. Now we come to the next one. Verse 26, he says, But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a man who builds a house on sand. Now take, take a look here in verse 24 and 26. These people, these two men, let's say, they heard the same thing. They heard the same thing. One says, you know what? This is what God wants from me. I choose to do that. I choose to believe what God says. This one says, ah, who cares? Who cares? He said it so many times, who believes it anymore? But take take a look what happens here. By flesh through unbelief. 
circumstances come up. What the, this is the person, if the boss yells at him, he'll yell back and swear and walk out the door. I quit. I'm done. He's basing on feelings. This is how I feel that moment. Later on, he doesn't feel that way, but that moment. And take a look here. It's an ungodly, sinful response happens. Sometimes we say, well, he couldn't control himself. That's true. But the Holy Spirit gives self-control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Take a look what happens. We do this to, to please myself, seek to get my idol or lust. Do whatever I need to do to get my feelings high again. That's where a lot of addictions come in. Look where it leads to. In the bottom line there, it says that's guilt, despair, discouragement, and depression. That's the person. He builds it on sand because it's never steady. So even if you take a look at an ocean, if this was a real picture, I, I guess it's, they put it together, but the tides come in. Where's this house? It's going to flood. It's going to go under. Everybody has to leave. But, you know, I look at this house here. It's sturdy. He put care into it. He wants a solid foundation. He wants to keep it safe for his family. And it doesn't seem that this person could care less about his family. It's feeling-based. One day dad is super angry, next day super depressed, and back and forth. That's not a Christian walk. Hey, I have another picture for you. Who knows what these two things are? You in Canada should for sure know what this is. What's the thing on the left there? Come on, am I right? So which one are you? Which one are you? A thermometer, do you react to everything that comes into your life? Men, when you come home and your wife is not looking the happiest and you turn sour, what's what, you know, every mood, <laughs> as the temperature gauge goes, the wife is mad, we get mad. Children are unhappy, we're unhappy. That's a, that's a thermometer. A thermostat says, I choose not to be angry. I will not get angry. I will remain calm. Let everybody fly off the I won't. That's a thermometer. We need more thermometers instead of thermostats. Uh, sorry, thermostats instead of thermometers, don't we? A lot of homes, they base it on a thermometer. So here I have a question. Do you help produce the right kind of environment, or do you just react to the environment in the house? A lot of times, a steady voice. Remember what the Bible says? A, uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. Thermostat. If somebody's mad, we will not be mad. We'll have a calm voice to give an answer. A lot of times everything becomes calm. But not if we're all thermometers, is it? Somebody's gauge goes up, the next gauge goes up. And that's where maybe the slapping comes in or something. Comes. Something happens. And that riles everything up. I said, let's rather than that be a thermostat. Parents, you know, you set the pace of atmosphere in your house. Do you realize that? They say sometimes the saying goes, Mama happy, everyone happy. Is it true? How about when daddy's mad? Everybody mad? <laughs> We've got to think that way too, right? I say, hey, we, we, we set that there. You know, and here I wrote down the background may set habits and behavior, but that can change by God's grace. Sometimes men tell me, well, I come from a very angry family. But I said, that doesn't excuse you why you're angry, does it? You need to make a choice. You can change everything that's happened in the past. You can make a solid choice to be a thermostat and then refuse to become angry. Think things through. Talk in a nice, calm voice. You can make that choice. Or you can just go with the flow and be a thermometer, and if everyone's happy, we're happy. Everyone's mad, we're mad. That doesn't take much energy, does it? But it takes a lot of self-control to be a thermostat. So the question, this is a topic, really. Functions of the Christian family. What was God's purpose in making families? You know, I think it's a beautiful thing. So what are the planned functions of the family in God's will and mind? So Adam and Eve were the first family, correct? Were Adam and Eve married? Okay, I'll ask that again. I don't know if the microphone worked. Were Adam and Eve married? Thank you. They were. <laughs> God brought them together. They were married in God's sight. Some people say, no, nope, they weren't married. Well, it says they were living in sin then, weren't they? No, there is, it was Eden, right? Then they were married. God brought Eve to Adam, husband, wife, the first parents. Correct? 
So what is, what is it that God desires for his family, for the family? And that is some of these things here, okay? The home is a place to teach and saturate with biblical principles. That means God's word is spoken of, talked about, explained, that children understand. You know, children, we say they're young, but they have, understand so much more. You know, uh, I, was, I was watching something. The children had a video at our place. Uh, so I was watching with the grandchildren. Uh, I, I forgot what it was, but anyway. And I remember one, one of my little granddaughters, she was watching there, she said, but, but my God is stronger than that. She said, <laughs> she, she, she took a stand. And I don't it wasn't even something important, but she, had, she, she was so clear that my God is stronger than that. I like that. They know who God is. You know, they're, they're so familiar with him. You know, today in our German culture, a lot of places, I'm not saying here, but, you know, in our German language, they, when they talk about God, they talk about the Bubushta, you know, the, one, the man upstairs. Let's say it that way. And I ask men sometimes, so who are we talking about? Who's living upstairs? No, he says, I'm talking about God. I said, let's talk about God. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Why are we avoiding God's name? Why are we doing that? Our children need to be taught that, that they understand the doctrines of what the Bible says, that God is love. God is light. God loves us. He cares about us. He sent his son to die for us. They understand the doctrines of what it is. Roman Catholics give up to seven years to mold the child to their doctrine. Seven years. I talked about that. Communists, probably in China or in former Russia, they say this way, a child is teachable up till seven years. Can be bent up till 12 years. Must be broken from 12 to 16 years. And they say after that only death can change them. I, I disagree on some of that. But I do believe the first years are where his character is built into. Okay? I remember I read a book once about one man. He said that in Russia, one orphanage there, it would never accept a child if it was over seven years old because they said they couldn't do anything with him. I disagree. I think God can still do wonders, miracles in a person's life, right? But I believe as a child is taught in a young age, he, that character is cemented in there. A lot of those things are in there already. But I believe by the grace of God, things can change. So take a look at Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10. Uh, I find verses here where, God, uh, where the people uh, talk to God. And so it says this way, verse 9 says, Who does the Lord think we are, they ask? Why does he speak to us like this? Are we little children just recently weaned? He tells us everything over and over, one line at a time, one line at a time, a little here and a little there. Do you understand what God is saying here? As a little child, they're supposed to understand who he is. When they're bigger, it's very, way harder to understand. But when they're small, little children, they understand that. You know, I've read articles, actually, from, from doctors. They say, what, what does an influence a child that's not even yet born if the mother prays and sings? It does something for that child. That child already knows. You know, I read that the Jewish culture... That when, when uh, a child was, uh, you know, in that, maybe that month I was born, the grandfather for that child would come over and he would talk to that child. He would bless that child. He would say, I'm, a, I'm excited that you're going to come to earth. I'm waiting for you. You know, in that, 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 uh, that sense. And, and get this. They say when that child was born, he came into the world, mom and dad were there and everything. But when that grandfather showed up and that child heard his voice, it got wild. I understand that, father, that grandfather was there because he had already pronounced a blessing on that child. He was welcoming it already. See, that's the difference. We, we don't understand that. But you know, mothers that have a very hard life at home, it affects their children that are not yet born. It's a very hard thing to grasp sometimes, but it's true. You know, and, and the importance of it, God's saying from, from, from when they're very small, he says, you talk about me. You tell them about me. You talk about me. God desires that they, they receive and understand doctrine even from the time they're weaned from the mother. That means when they're taken away. Muslim countries, I, I read this, that uh, in Muslim countries in their schools there, that some of the children are forced to eat parts of the Quran. Like that, that, that means it's so embedded into them that they believe the Quran is correct. And see, that, that means a lot of sense to me sometimes when I, you read about Muslims and how they're faithful. You know, they, they will die for their faith too. But they're, they're from the ground up, you know, from little boys and girls, they're, they're taught that. And when they go to school, they have to memorize the Koran, parts of it. And if they don't, they're beaten. They need to understand the Koran. So when they grow up, that's, that's part of their mind there. 
I read a, one man's testimony. He said when he was seven years old, his dad had brought him to the desert in, in uh, Africa, in Sudan, I think it was, and he was put into a school there for a couple of years. He said, when I got out of that school at 10 years of age, I was ready to kill every Christian. I was ready. Because that was ingrained into my life. But God had a plan for him. It's a really beautiful story how he came to be a believer, right? But at that point in time, even Hindus realized that then children need to be taught from a small age to believe in their gods, right? So my, my, my thoughts is we don't saturate. That means like a child sponge, you know, they, they, they get everything in. So if we don't saturate a child's heart and mind with biblical principles, where's our next generation? Who's going to tell them about that? I know that this generation here seems that people are leaving the churches in droves. They don't want anything to do with church, young people especially. Who's telling them about God? Who's being setting the example for these children to actually believe in someone? Our Almighty God. So take a look at Psalm 78, verses 5 and 8. It says this way, For he issued his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel, he commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God even in that time already. And God is saying, talk about me. Tell them about me, that they will tell their children about who God is. It's lacking in these days, right? Parents must have a dedicated heart to instruct their child. Are we convinced that God is our God, that Christ died for my sin? If we're not convinced, how should our children do that, right? Uh, I wrote down here, we can't expect the right things to just rub off on them. Remember what I told you about if we're born into a family that maybe attends a Mennonite church, we're not automatically Mennonites. We're not even automatically Christians here. But we expect it to rub off on them. I said, no, we don't, we don't expect it to rub off on them. We need to teach them. The church and the, the Sunday school, the youth, they help with that. But it's the parents' responsibility to teach their children, not somebody else. Here we come to Deuteronomy, these ver verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and I got verse till 9 here. So he says this way, Listen to Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord alone. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? New Testament there, Jesus said it. Then he says this way, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, when you are getting up, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Does that sound important? God's saying it is important. Extremely important. We need to teach, review the past. What has God done for us? How has God led us? Warning about future if we don't rely on God. And I believe there's many, many ways we can build uh, a love for God. I, I choose to believe that, right? Hedge of protection. So some of these things, we, we might not see eye to eye on all these things, but I'm just going to put it here, out here for the sake of the class, right? Uh, I have one hedge of protection sacrificing them for them to have a, a Christian school. Not, I'm not saying it has to be that way. But I can say if we, we homeschool, I believe then even our children can uh, know who God is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against that at all, okay? What I'm saying, but some parents can't afford that, can't do it. They send their children to public school, but I say it's the best thing if they can come under an Christian influence. And I think at home, it's the most important thing. But if we can do it in school or whatever we do, it's good. Uh, the second one, a TV. We're not having one at all. Maybe it's best not having one. Remember, like, even a, a cell phone these days, like, I know myself, if you find something interesting, it's not necessarily bad. It's, it's a good thing. You're learning. But how easy does it lead to the next one, the next one? Pretty soon you find out you've been there three-quarter hour, and you're just still watching there. It's not nothing bad. But, but you know, sometimes it's maybe it's good not to have it at all, some of these things, right? How about music? Is it important what kind of music we listen to? What do you think? Hmm. Does music do something to a person? Get this. I read this. They say in these big malls in Canada and the United States, you always have music, right? So they have a master switch in the office. So at the beginning of the day, they have the music very slow. 
That means when we come in, we can, we can look at everything and study everything, and we're walking around. Even the carts drive slow. But once they want the people out, they turn the music faster, and the carts start moving faster. <laughs> everything starts moving fast. You know what? I told that somewhere. One, one restaurant owner came to me and said, John, I know it's true. He says, when I have music slow, people chew slowly. When I have fast music, they chew fast. <laughs> you believe that? Music does something to a person. Yes. So is it important what kind of music we listen to? Absolutely. Okay? We need to be careful what we listen to. Our children should have the right kind of friends. And I'm not saying we avoid people that aren't believers. What I'm saying is we need to be careful who they associate with the most. And it's good if they have the other family is Christian, there are believers there. The home should be a place to establish a heritage. Heritage is what, what we leave behind. I read somewhere once that said, you're not ready to die unless you know what's going to be written on your tombstone. So what's going to be written there? Well, our tombstone is going to be, he was a very rich man. That's it. But I, I, I know I read a, a tombstone and a, a, a picture once that said, uh, on, on this man's tombstone, I forgot the name of this guy, but on the tombstone it said, he knew God. Isn't that beautiful? He knew God. Isn't that a wonderful legacy? You know, when, when you think about your grandfather, I have very good memories of my grandfather, beautiful memories. But one thing I distinctly remember from him when we went there to visit, he always had time to talk about Scripture. He was always curious, what did you have Sunday in church? What did you hear? Tell me about it. I'm going to tell you what I heard. That was important to him. I remember that. He, he might have been well off. I don't even know. But I remember that part. He, he loved the Lord. He wanted to talk about it to people. I remember that. So what kind of legacy? So a dad, the greatest contribution that a dad will ever make in life is establishing and maintaining a real Christian home where Christ and God are number one. Greatest contribution a man will make is his own children. What are you going to do? You know, it's kind of, the Bible it says in Psalm 127, it's kind of like an archer. He takes a bow and arrow, and he, those arrows are our children, and we, have, we, we, we pull back, and once, once they're gone, they're gone, but where, where, where's it aimed toward? A lot of times in our families today, I notice that parents are very, very much concerned that their children will have a good life. They will have enough money. They will have a nice home. They will have nice vehicles. All, the, it's all these physical things. It's not wrong to see in those things. But where is the spiritual aspect of that? Where is their soul one day? Are we concerned about that too? Or is it just the physical part that they'll have, have it really good? I say the spiritual part should be more important. You know, our moms, the mothers are sometimes frustrated, irritated, and under such pressures that they also lack the vision of molding a child for God. We can become so enmeshed in our world today in thinking we lose track. And it's the pressures in our world today. They offer so many things, right? Children are a heritage of the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 4. And we want to pass this on to our children, our heritage, that they can say, Mom and Dad, they love the Lord. Home is a place to teach the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Is it this giant hammer? God is just waiting for you to make a mistake. What is fear of the Lord? I sometimes think we have that wrong. Fear of the Lord, we know what God can do and what he will do one day. But for me, fear of the Lord is this. I'm going to give you a kind of a short story kind of thing. <clears throat> Let's say there's ten boys out on the streets, and one of them is a believer. He gave his life to the Lord maybe a week ago or so. And, and these boys are all together. There's this tenth one. He's not partaking in all the things that these guys are doing. But, you know, he's just still friends, the only ones he knows. But he's not partaking in that. And suddenly the nine boys say, you know what, we should go to that, in that house and that person there and break the windows of that house because of what they did. So this one boy, the tenth boy, says, you know, let's not do that. So the nine boys start making fun of him and say, you know what, you're just chicken. You're scared that if dad finds out he's going to spank you. And he says, you know what, I'm not even scared of dad because I don't even want to do it. I'm scared of hurting my God that forgave me everything. Why would I want to do something to hurt him? But his dad says, I'm not scared because I wouldn't do it. But hurting God, that's different. That's fear of God. Because we know that what he can do to us, but we know that the love he gave us, so we can live a different life. Fear of the Lord. And you know what? As the children understand that. So I had it written down here, what, basically what your parents fear, the children will fear. So here's meditation, so we're not going to go into that. But 
a home is a place of rejoicing, fellowship, forgiveness. It should be. You know, a home ought to be a place where love is received and given, a place for caring and developing sensitivity to others, uh, learning to forgive and to be forgiven. That should be the place. It's a perfect place to do that. We, we want it always to be done, but let's be, do the example. James wrote of two kinds of wisdom. When we parents say, well, we, we don't know enough. Yes, you do. The Bible tells us here that if we ask God for wisdom, he'll give us the right wisdom to deal with things. Me and Justine have needed wisdom so many times in our life. Because you, you come to a point, you can't understand why the child is doing this. What do we do now? God, God had an answer. He showed us a way. And he's saying, you know, there, there's a world kind of wisdom. It's, uh, James brings it out this way. It brings confusion, strife, envy, every evil work. But he says the wisdom which comes from God, that's something totally different. It's beautiful. It's molding the children's life for the future, instilling character, teaching them right from wrong, good and bad. They need to be taught. So we must bring cor a correction to do the right, and we are accountable to train up our children. Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Have we done that, fathers? I have. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with a discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. There's the thing. That's the key. What I see here is what Paul is saying. The way I understand it, Paul is saying, Fathers, stop doing these things to your children because they will turn rebellious against you and they will forsake the church and God and everything. They will leave. Stop provoking them. And there's a lot of things that provoke children, okay? They're, when mom and dad are not transparent, they, they're prideful. Uh, when mom and dad fight, all these things. And so he says, stop that. We're not part of this world. So uh, one thing, uh, correction or discipline, we have to be engaged in is preventive. That, that means that we want to mold their character to give them convictions. They can't have your convictions. You can tell them what your convictions are, that they will receive them and actually work with them. Conviction is to do good, to love somebody. Even if they, they hit me, I choose to love. If we ex be an example of that, our children can learn from us. But listen, what kind of character does a child have? Character is kind of being loving, kind, esteeming the other one greater than yourself. Uh, there's a lot of things we can teach our children. Uh, one of the books that we sometimes use in our house, or actually use in school too for devotion sometimes, was uh, this character building. Uh, what's that? Uh, what's the guy's name? U.S. guy. Um, Oh, forgot it. Mention you mentioned it, but I, I found that, that very interesting. Uh, when, when the books you open the books, it has a Bible story, and then it will have an animal. It'll tell you all about an animal, kind of the characteristics of that animal. Uh, I, I just forgot the name. Maybe I'll remember it yet. But it, it, they're worth buying and using for the children. It's actually a beautiful thing to take your children, sit down, and telling the Bible story and the characteristics of that person and this animal and so forth. It, it, it gets their attention. They're beautiful pictures with these books there. I say that's where we can build character, loving, courageous, uh, uh, patient, yeah? So uh, I have a lot of, I put down a lot of verses that I find, character traits that God wants his children to have. Uh, I don't have a copy, but um, if you want, I can leave it up later a little bit. If somebody wants to write something down, I'm, uh, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> I don't know if you want to or not, but uh, I'll, I'll turn back to that later on. They want to do, uh, that they want to do right before the temptation hits them. We must guide them. Parents, we're to guide. If you remember the story of Eli, what happened there? Eli did not guide his sons. He heard all these bad things these boys were doing, but he took no action. And they continued their evil stuff till they died. And we find that Eli, he also fell backwards and he died. But one of the things I find in Eli's story is that God held Eli responsible. He says, you're responsible. Not the mom, not the government. You are responsible. And dads, we need to take that to heart. There has to be discipline. When I, when I say discipline, I don't always mean the belt. Sometimes just sitting down and talking to that child, making them understand. Sometimes we have to go a little further because we love them. We want to help them avoid certain things in life. But if we want to neglect that, we are not a guidance to them. God holds us responsible. When I think of Abraham and his story, he was concerned about his son's need of a wife. Because where he was living was heathen people. He says, my son is not supposed to marry somebody that's a heathen, a godless person. 
So he sends his worker. I don't know how long the guy traveled his camel train, but he brings, brings back uh, Isaac's wife. What was her name? Rebecca. You know, you know what I find interesting in that story is, here's Rebecca leaving mom and dad and home and what she knows. She gets on this camel and she's off to see a husband she's never seen before. You ever thought of that? <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking that uh, she probably had a conversation with this uh, work, Abram's worker. She probably sometimes asked him, so this Isaac, how big is his nose? Like, does he have big ears or shaggy hair? Like, what does he look like? But nothing stopped her. She went. You know what it says? When she got there, she, she got off the camel. And let me ask you a Bible question. Where was Isaac when Rebecca got there? Pardon? In the field. In the field. What was he doing? He was praying. He was praying to God. When he came and saw Rebecca, so Rebecca is uh, the tradition there. She veils her face. But it says Isaac loved Rebecca. You know why? She was from God. He had prayed for a wife. He was totally secure. This was the wife that God gave him. And he loved her. The father did that. The father made sure that he wouldn't marry among those people there. I don't think Abraham hated them. But he says, my son, he's supposed to have a God-fearing woman in his life. Parents, our job, one of the things, that we must prepare our children for marriage and life's occupation. A lot of things happen among youth. And they hear a lot of things that should be coming from parents in a good, healthy way, not on the streets. We teach our children about these things. Mom and dad are the example. You know, we, we deal with a lot of youth sometimes uh, through the years. And, and there's youth, they say, we never want to get married. We don't want to get married. I say, why not? Well, mom and dad, they fight like dog and cat. Why would we want to get married and get into that? We don't want to get married. But I said, do you know any people that you would actually say they have a good marriage? They know exactly. So I sometimes ask them, so what do you see in that marriage that makes it good? They have beautiful answers. They see love, they see harmony, they see understanding, appreciating one another, which is the model is not at home. And I say, we parents make the model. So marriage instruction ought to come from parents. I think it's a good thing. I encourage young people to, before you get married, do a thorough counseling. Get, find a minister or maybe the church or somebody else that you trust, and you go through counseling. Don't, don't take any stuff into your marriage. When we've dealt with people in our work, we sometimes I've had this here happen, that this husband and wife, you know, uh, everything was out in their life, nothing worked, but suddenly something comes up, back, up from 30 years ago that happened that the wife or the husband had never talked about. They never talked about these things, and how much that hurts. So I say to young people, instead of doing that, deal with it now, before you get married. Deal with it now. Find somebody, the ministerial, wherever your church, but do some counseling, make sure there's nothing that will stop you from giving your whole heart and mind to that spouse that you want to marry. We ought to be praying for our children's mate from the time of their birth. This is true. So me and Justina, when we pray, I, I, for the last couple of while, I haven't, haven't done that, but we've prayed for the future uh, spouses for the grandchildren. So our children are all married, but I'm thinking of the grandchildren now. I don't think it's wrong to pray for a spouse for them too, that God will honor that. And you know, we pray for them. We, we're concerned that they will find something that will uh, help their faith to grow. Teach them the right human relationships. Respecting one another, honoring one another. You can do that from a small age that they learn to love one another. Like when they're playing in a sandbox, you know? Uh, I tell couples this sometimes. So when, back in the day when we were small, we would play in our sandbox. So if I wasn't happy with the, the, my, going my way, I would take my little loader and I'd leave. And I say couples do the same thing. When they're unhappy, they just want to leave. They pack up and leave. They say, hey, we're not children anymore. Now we need to deal with it. But if we teach them at a young age to honor and respect, like uh, Romans 12, verse 10 says, and honor preferring one another, it's, it's brought up that way. It's okay for the neighbor's boy to use your loader. It's okay, totally fine. And he understands that. A giving heart from a young age, that's a beautiful thing. Giving thanks unto God, submitting one to another, another thing we can teach them. And I believe husband and wife submit one to another. Ephesians 5.21 says so. We submit out of love one to another. The children see that. But you know, the natural tendency is to break away and get my own way. Isn't that it? You see that in little children. They're not always very happy to give off a toy or let somebody else play with their toys. But we teach them it's a good thing to do. It's a loving thing to do. 
Human authority, be obedient. I believe this is a very strong one that we learn how to, to yield. Uh, one is to government. We're supposed to pray for our government. Keep the laws that they have, okay? It's, it's our obligation. God says, you do this for me. It's our parents. You know, my parents, I love my parents. But, but one of the things I've learned is this. I will honor, respect, cherish my parents, but I don't have to obey them because I'm married. I don't have to obey them. But if you're at home still, young people, you're still at home with mom and dad, you obey them. God wants you to, to honor him. Be obedient. But, you know, if I don't listen to my... My dad is good at advice giving, okay? Beautiful. <laughs> but I say, me and Justina will make that choice if we want to do that or not. That's our choice now. But when I was home, living under dad's roof, then I didn't have that choice. I want to obey dad. God said, John, you obey dad. I wasn't good at it. I told you that. Again, I wish I could turn that clock back. I'd do it differently. I see things different now. But not at that time. But be obedient. And school authorities, or whatever. If you go to school or homeschool, be obedient. Children to their parents or government. And I, I, I could even put here to our church, church authority. It's very important that we learn where we are at. Okay? I believe we honor God. Teach them loyalty, uh, unity. Loyalty means keep your word. Courtesy means uh, teaching your children to say please and thank you. I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, uh, we, we want our children to do that. We taught them to do that. And our little grandchildren, it, it's uh, wonderful. When they, when they finish a meal, they'll always come to Justina and say, thank you, Grandma, for that fine meal. That's beautiful. You're teaching them. You know, That's something that if they go visiting, they will be that respectful there too. Teach them when they're young. Manners. Who knows what manners is? Okay. Some are smiling. What does that mean when you smile with manners? You have good manners? <laughs> you know, when I was a high school teacher in Arbor, Manitoba, every year I did a manners class with the children. They loved it. I don't know if they kept it, but they loved it. We, we, we learned how to set a plate, you know, how to put knives and forks came, and how to answer the phone in a polite, nice way. <laughs> it was just uh, added something that I had there, but... It's, it's a good thing. You know, manners, a, a well-mannered young person is beautiful. It's beautiful, even older people. If we have manners and we, we speak respectfully, it's beautiful. Teach them when they're young. A punctuality, who knows what that means? On time. You know what on time is? Then you're five minutes before it starts there. That's on time. My second brother, he has, punct he, he has punctuality to a T. That means when we have phoned together and he says, uh, John, we want to meet at that and that restaurant that day at that, clock, that time, be there. Okay? So a whole week I know it, right? But you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you something. If I'm five minutes late, he's on his way home. He will not stay there. He's punctual. He says, John, you knew it for a whole week that I was coming, didn't you? You knew it. Why am I going to sit there half a day and you're not coming? I was on time. Punctuality. For me, punctuality means five minutes before it starts. That's it. I learned that from my dad. <laughs> I mean, she's seen her in the same way. Be on time. If you've agreed to something, be on time. Children the same way. Hygiene. Bathing every day. Combing. Brushing teeth. We teach them when they're young. It's something automatically they'll be doing. Automatically. It's beautiful. Table manners. How's that one sound? <laughs> oh, it comes under th saying thank you and being courteous and so forth, right? The function, this function of the home cannot be ignored, and children will not naturally be loyal. One, one, one last thought, and we'll, we'll stop, okay? So here's one. And, and this goes into a longer topic of being obedient, okay, the children and so forth. But I'll, I'll just leave it at that. One of the fundamental truths of parenting, the child's relationship with his parent is training grounds for his relationship with his God. Parents, are you listening? In other words, the bottom part there says, in other words, would it be right if my child reacted to God the same way he just reacted to my command? Would we be happy? You know when children back talk, they're mad, they're grouchy, is that being obedient? How, how do we see ourselves to God when we do that? So I say, this is what I'm saying. The child's relationship with his parent is training grounds for his relationship with God, being obedient. We want to be obedient, don't we? We say it. 
Let's teach our children to be obedient. When mom and dad say something, let's be obedient. I remember that for me, personally. Uh, if my dad said something, there, there was no option. There was no option. It meant to be done. And you want, when I look back, I thought my dad was very strict, but you know, today I see a good point what he did. He didn't want to say things twice or three times. He said, once is enough. If you heard me, but my dad was this way. If he asked me something and I wasn't doing it right away, he says, John, did you hear? Did you understand what I said? Did you hear me? I want it done. And not in an angry way. I don't have an angry dad. But what he said, he expected to be done. But this way, in other words, would it be right if my child reacted to God? The way he reacts to my commands if we ask them to do something. So let's do it in the right way, that we are obedient. Let's, let's set the example for our children that what God has commanded, we want to do. When God has said it, we choose to believe it, we just do it for him. Even against, if we sometimes don't want to, but we say, God, according to your word, I want to do this, forgiving somebody, showing love and appreciation, honoring the next person, let's do that. Because that's what God requires of us. I go back to here, we need to make a choice. Are we commandment-oriented or are we feeling-oriented? Are we built on the solid rock? Are we basing our life and commands on feelings? And I'd say, let's, let's do it in a way that we can be commandment-oriented to honor God in everything we do. And uh, I want to pray for God's blessing on each of you parents. So when I see these young children here, it just uh, warms my heart. I, lo- I love that. I love children. And that God will bless you with wisdom how to deal with these things. That We can teach them to be obedient because it's important to God that we are obedient and the children also. And I'm saying this in a way, you don't understand that I'm saying be rough or, you know, the, the strap. And the, I'm saying show them love and attention, appreciation. If you can win your child's heart, you already have his attention. He does not want to hurt you. That's why he's saying, I want to honor dad because I don't want to disobey him. I don't want to hurt my dad. But the same way in God's, it's God's sight that we obey God when he asks us to do something. And we're obedient by example. Okay, I'd like to pray yet before we close here. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for this beautiful evening, the times together. Thank you, Lord, for all these dear people that came out, especially these parents with children, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for each and every beautiful child, young person that's here today. And I thank you, Lord, that you have a wonderful plan for them. My prayer is that you will grant them wisdom, what what your plan is for them. Father, you have a desire for each one to serve you. We all have different gifts that you've given to us, but Lord, we can have that desire to be obedient to your call. Help us, Lord, as parents to model that example. When, when you call us, that we are obedient, Lord, that we don't want to pout or be angry. But more than that, Lord, we say we want to humble ourselves and say, yes, Lord, we want to do this for you. And sometimes I know the feelings, of good feelings come later, but help us to have an obedient heart, Father. What we teach, we want to do ourselves. Thank you again for your word, which is really, really spoken to us, Lord. You expect us as parents to talk about you throughout the day, Lord. When it, when it occurs to us, when we want to share in your glory, when we look at nature, we can see how wonderful you are. Help us, Lord to talk about that, that our children see that there's no need to be shy but talking about our Creator. Thank you again for this beautiful evening. They're asking you, Lord, to bless us with a good night again. If you give us another day tomorrow, help us, Lord, to honor, honor you and to be a blessing one to another. In Jesus' name, amen.